music, the ways that we can praise the Lord. Music is the top of the list, isn't it? Pretty close. We're told God inhabits our praise, and so it's wonderful to experience and celebrate his presence with us this morning. For some time now, I've been talking about uh, the subject of grace. It's a big topic. I uh, started out thinking I would uh, do a sermon on grace. And uh, I'm at uh, number three now. And, you know, I could just go on on this. You know, And, and even this, the subject of grace is this big, and I'm taking one little slice out of it just talking about um, really the power of grace within us. And so this morning I'm going to expand into the topic of the glory of grace and tie that in a little bit with the theme of Christmas, the Advent, and uh, consider what we're really talking about when we're talking about God's grace in the context of glory and the glory of God's grace. So with that said, we'll get started. Let's bow our heads once again and ask the Lord to guide us. Father in heaven, we are so blessed as your children. It is a wonderful thing to be the recipients of your grace, to experience that grace. And the things you've heard this morning, whether it's reading or the music or the prayer, it's all a a praise, a thanksgiving for your grace. And now as we spend this time in your word, we pray that you will guide our minds and our thoughts, help us to hear your voice, help us to understand what it is each of us needs to understand today to help us along our way through the next days and weeks and the coming new year. We pray that you will be present here now, fill us with your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to take a moment, like I said, I've been on this big topic of grace for uh, several weeks here, and since I'm only here every other week, this goes back a while, and you might need a refresher, so I'm going to just, again, quickly just bring, if you weren't here before, I'm going to bring you up to speed. Those of you who were will just take a little bit of time to review. I have talked about uh, the power of grace the kingdom of grace, and today we're going to get into the glory of grace. So let me go back, first of all, with a review of the power of grace. Just hit a couple high points. The first thing that I want us to understand is that grace is not a passive trait. It's not something God stands off here and says, well, you're okay, you'll be okay. But it's a very present reality. It is God's presence in us. It is God's power manifest in the believer. It is not God overlooking sin, but it's God coming into us and overcoming sin. It's a power that works within us. To summarize it, I think one of the best things I've ever read is this article from the Review and Herald. October 12, 1897, and Ellen White brings some thoughts together. The working of the Holy Spirit and the power of grace. Notice how this comes together here. And we'll just use this as kind of a summary of where I was going um, about four weeks ago when I was here. She says, it is essential to live by every word of God. Else, our old nature will constantly reassert itself. We're familiar with that? The old nature is constantly trying to reassert itself. But here's what she says, it is the Holy Spirit, comma, the redeeming grace of truth in the soul. I'd like to stop right there. Notice how she blends the two. The Holy Spirit, the redeeming grace of truth. You'll see this this equation here, if you will. The Holy Spirit's working and the grace of truth. And as we understand God's grace, we have to be looking and understanding that we're seeing the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit, the redeeming grace of truth in the soul, that makes the followers of Christ one with one another and one with God. The work of grace is a unifying power, isn't it? It brings us together as a people and it brings us together with God. The interesting thing here is now she expands on this work of the Holy Spirit. 
I want you to particularly notice as we read on here the use of the pronouns. First noun, he, talking about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. And then she transitions into it, talking about the power of grace. And notice how these two come together as we read on. He, talking about the Holy Spirit, he alone can expel enmity, envy, and unbelief. He sanctifies the entire affections. He restores the willing, desirous soul from the power of Satan unto God. And then she makes the transition. This is the power of grace. She's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. He does this, he does this, he does this, but this is the power of grace. You see it? The work of the Holy Spirit in the power of grace are the same thing. And she goes on to say this. It is a divine power. The power of grace is the power of divinity. God in the Holy Spirit working in us. It's an amazing thought when you put it all together. Now notice, she transitions from what he does, the Holy Spirit. This is a power of grace. It is a divine power and under its influence. Now we're talking about the power of grace, but you'll see they're the same thing. There is a change from the old habits, customs, and practices, which when cherished, separate the soul from God. This is what the power of grace is supposed to do in the believer. And the work of sanctification goes on in the soul, constantly progressing and enlarging. It's an amazing thing. The work of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and we talk about grace. And I have to be honest with you, this, when I read this a while back, was a new thought to me. That really we're talking about the same thing. Two different ways of looking at the same thing. The divine power of God, the divine power of grace, is the working of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And that gets me thinking even further along. But this is just a review. The power of grace. So by way of review, it is a converting power. It is a saving power. These are all things we read. Texts or things that Ellen White said about it. Redeeming power. Transforming power. Sanctifying power. Character perfecting power. Sin conquering power. Faith building power. Law keeping power. And we just read it in the one I just read. Enmity and envy expelling power. And unifying power. And this last one, restoring power. Restoring us to the image of God. And this takes us right into the topic that I want to discuss today. Because we're talking about the glory of grace. And the glory of grace is the grace that restores us to God's image. When I talk the power of God's grace, there is one text, and I've shared this with you before. And I think this summarizes in Scripture, better than anything, the thought of grace. God is able to make all grace abound. Here again, I underlined the all, the every, the abounding. All grace abound. God makes all grace abound. God is all. He's above all. God is all in all. And here's what he says. He makes all grace abound where? Toward us. All grace abounds toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. That's transforming power. That takes us from the works of sin and self to every good work and having everything we need to do every good work. Is that clear? Grace is the power that takes us from being sinful, self-centered people to being others-centered to being... A, having an abundance for every good work. And that's a unifying power. When selfishness is taken out of our life, now we can be one with one another and one with God. From the power of grace, we turn our attention to the kingdom of grace. And there's one key text, and that is the words of Jesus. And we talked about this last time I was here, where Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said that to Pharisees, bad people. The kingdom of God is within you. The question is, will you let God reign in his kingdom or not? Or will you allow Satan to reign in God's kingdom? That's the question. As sin reigned in death, Paul says, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. The idea is God is to reign within the life of every believer and grace is the reigning power. The work of the Holy Spirit, that divine power of grace reigning as king in our lives. I also had this up last time I was here that uh, the reminder there's no middle ground in this situation. You're on one side or the other. Not to choose that God shall reign in your life is to choose that he shall not reign. In other words, if we don't say, Lord, you're the king, then we're choosing to push him away. And to choose that God shall not reign is to choose that Satan, the usurper, shall reign. And it's a sad story that uh, all too often Satan reigns in the lives of people. And it's particularly sad that he reigns in the lives of people who, in fact, call themselves Christians. So there's one appeal here, and that is, let him reign in his kingdom. Because where the grace of God reigns, there his character is revealed. Right? When grace reigns in the life, his character is revealed. So, We've looked at the power of God's grace, the kingdom of God's grace, and I want to talk about the glory of God's grace. We're going to transition right here. And one of the, the things when I started into the study of grace and God's power and then his kingdom, one of the verses that just stood out to me, and I'm going to share some of these with you. These are well-known Bible verses. Most of us have known these since we were very young, uh, if not at least since we first became Christians. And uh, we're going to look at some very familiar verses, but some ideas that I think are amazing when we start understanding that the topic of grace is about the topic of God's kingdom, his power, his glory in the believer. And the first of these is the Lord's Prayer. How many of you know the Lord's Prayer by heart? Yeah, probably almost everyone here. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That caught my attention because I'm thinking about the kingdom of grace. Wait a minute. When we pray thy kingdom, of, thy kingdom come, are we talking about do we want a, him to come soon? Yes. Amen. Absolutely. But if you start thinking about the kingdom of God within you, we don't have to limit it to that, do we? We can say, wait a minute. Lord, my prayer is for your kingdom to come here. For you to reign in me so that this is a part of your kingdom. Do you see that? It's an interesting prayer. And, and the, the Lord's Prayer, you'll notice, is very present tense that way overall. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's a prayer to say, yeah, we need to have a change here. We need your kingdom to be here. We need your will to be done now. Give us this day our daily bread. That's certainly present tense, isn't it? That's a prayer for right now. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or forgive us our trespasses, our sins against one another, as we forgive those who sin against us. It goes on, lead us not into temptation. Is that a prayer for right now? Yeah. And deliver us from evil. Now some people might think, well, maybe it's about deliver us from evil in the long run. But I believe it's present tense. I'll talk about that a little more here. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For, and notice I bold the word for. For is a little word, but it's a big word because it has a connecting value. It says, right, because, in fact, I put the uh, Young's literal translation down there. Deliver us from the evil because yours is the reign and the power and the glory. There's a connection between deliverance from evil and this idea of God's Kingdom and power and glory. There's a connection. The kingdom of grace, the power of grace, and the glory of grace. This is where my thoughts went as I was looking at this, saying, wow, right there in the Lord's Prayer. And if this is present tense, wait a minute, we need the deliverance from evil now. For, or because, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I've always said that prayer with kind of the thought, yeah, God, you're in charge. Yours is the kingdom. You have all the power. You have all the glory. If 
But I'm thinking this in a completely different manner. Now I believe that the prayer actually closes with a vow, a commitment to God to give myself to him. To say, here I am, Lord. Yours is this kingdom. This is where I want it. It's your power that I want to be a part of my life and I want my life to glorify you. I want your kingdom, your power, and your glory here with me. Take me. I'm yours. I want you to consider this thought. It's really an interesting thing, especially when we consider the essence of Christianity and what separates us from some of the other ways of thinking and considering God. How many of you have heard of deists? Deists. Deism, in essence, is a belief that God created everything, set everything in motion, and then just stepped back, and here we are. On our own, God is up there, away from us somewhere in the universe, and we're left down here to just kind of dangle and do whatever we do on our own. But Christianity, the, the faith of Christianity says, no, no, God is present in our life. He isn't a far away God, He is near you even in your heart. That in fact we have a near God. And so even the deist can say, yours is the kingdom. Well, the deist believes, in fact, that God rules in all the universe. The deist understands that. The deist says, yes, God's omnipotent. He's the all-powerful. God has all the power. No problem with the deist here. All the glory, no problem. As long as we keep God out there, we can, we can put all of this in here. And I don't believe that that was the intent of Jesus at all. I believe that Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, came down to this closing line and said, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Because here I am, Lord. It's your kingdom. Your power can be right here working in me. And I want to glorify you. Food for thought. Food for thought. So there's the three aspects of grace. The kingdom of grace, the power of grace, and the glory of grace. And like I said, this is only a small bite. There's a whole lot more to grace. We could probably go on and on. But the point is, is that all of these have a direct connection in the believer. I've gone over uh, the topics of the kingdom and the power and showing how Scripture teaches that those are applicable to the believer and the life of the believer. Now then, if we're going to get into this topic of the glory of grace, we need to look at Jesus. Don't you think that's a good spot? And at this time of year, where better to start? Our look into the glory of God's grace absolutely must include a look into the glory of his condescension. And that's really what we're talking about. You know, a lot of lessons come out of the story of Jesus' first advent when he came to Bethlehem and so on. But um, at the core of all of it has to be a picture of condescension. The God of heaven becomes a man, becomes a sinful, living in sinful flesh. He doesn't become sinful, I want to be clear on that. But he comes into sinful humanity, immerses himself in sinful society, and so it is that Jesus' condescension is really where salvation focuses. And this is very interesting because glory is associated with condescension. That also is somewhat of a backward thought to most of us. Glory is like all this magnificence somewhere in heaven or sometimes when God appeared on earth and all of this brightness and all of that. And I'm not saying that doesn't apply in a sense. But let's not limit it to all of that. In fact, God's glory, the real glory, is wrapped up in the condescensions itself. The idea that God himself, of his own volition, by his own free will choice, decided to humble himself even to the death of the cross. So in the Bethlehem account, we're going to read this from Luke 2. By the way, thank you, Jordan, for reading the account in Matthew. Here we are. We're going to read a few verses in Luke 2. 
Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Here's where we come across the glory of the Lord first. And it says the glory of the Lord shone about them. Are we talking about a bright? Absolutely. I don't want anyone here to think that I'm saying that there aren't other aspects of what we're talking about when we talk about the glory of God. Yes, there is a bright shining glory. But there's one other thing that we may overlook here in this particular sentence. It says, wait a minute. An angel of the Lord stood before them. Right? You got the picture? And the glory of the Lord shone around them. Whose glory is it? Well, it says it's the glory of the Lord. But who's there? The angel. Is it possible that the glory of the Lord can actually shine from a created being? Think about it. The angel comes, the angel who is totally given to God, the angel who is without sin, the angel who is filled with God and his spirit and his grace and his power, and in that angel is described the glory of the Lord. And in this case, even, it is described as a shining, right? The glory of the Lord shone around them. It is a brightness. And in fact, it caught the attention of the shepherds, didn't it? It says they were greatly afraid. Wham! Huge sensory experience. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. By the way, that good tidings... I like that term, you know why? Because most the place we read the word gospel, same word, good tidings, good news, the good news. And here it is, right when Jesus comes to earth, right in the beginning, the first announcement, the angel comes with the gospel. I bring you the gospel, good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's the message. I bring you good tidings of great joy, and then here's the message in quotes, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I know that I've shared this basic thought before when I've been here, that it has struck me in the past as I've read this, this connection, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That in fact, that is a description of the law of God and his character. The first four commandments describe this relationship between God and man. And the last six describe the relationship between man and his fellow man. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Do you see it? It's a statement of the, the commandments and how they break down. Interestingly enough, God's glory is his character. How many of you have heard that before? It's probably a lot of us have actually heard that. I'm going to read a little bit from that. But here's the, my line of thinking. God's glory is his character. The law is a transcript of his character. We've heard of that before too, right? And then we read this account. His law is summarized in the two parts. Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And I'm thinking that what the angel's message is, here's the good news, it has something to do with God's character. Behold your God. This idea of God's glory is his character, I'll take just a couple minutes here to go through. Exodus 33, 18 and 19. This is uh, where the golden calf big event has just happened. If you haven't, uh, if you're not familiar with the story, read in Exodus 32. You'll get that account. Exodus 33, God says to Moses, Moses, 
Let's start over. I'm going to start with you, and then we're going to build the nation from here. Moses says, no, 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 you can't do that, God. You brought this people this far. It's going to look bad. Leave them now. You've got to stick with them. And he makes this intercession. It's a, it's a fantastic story. And it's at this point, during this basic conversation, Moses says to God, please, show me your glory. Notice what God thinks his glory is. We, again, are likely to think in terms of glory as this, this bright essence or whatever. But as the story here proceeds, we can see that, in fact, when God responds to this request, how he does it. Then he said, this is God now, his response to that. Moses says, show me your glory. God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. What's goodness? We're talking about character, aren't we? I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And we see a connection throughout scriptures. Name and character. Name and character always go together. So what God is saying is, I'll show you my character. You want to see my glory? Here's what my character is all about. I will, and then in, uh, yeah, chapter 33, verses 19 to 21, continuing on, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, notice how it works together here, while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand. There is an element of a physical glory that he's saying, I'm going to protect you from this, but I'm still going to show you my glory. You can't see this and live. But here's what I want you to know, Moses. I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. We skip forward a few verses. It's actually in Exodus 34. And we see where God comes down and does just what he told Moses he was going to do. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, that is with Moses there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. There it is again. He's going to show him his glory. I'm going to proclaim my name, God says. The Lord passed before him. And what did he say? He proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God merciful. Listen to the attributes of God. His character this is the glory of God, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And so there it is, the picture of God's character, and this shows that in fact, the glory of God, while it may include brightness and many other aspects of God, the one thing we can never leave out is, is that it is God's character. God's character is his glory. His glory is his character. Ellen White commenting on the birth of Jesus and his condescension in Desire of Ages has this to say, and talking about glory and glorification. When the fullness of time had come, and this is a reference to the prophecies, the time prophecies that predicted Jesus' first advent, the deity, that is God, was glorified by pouring upon the world, look at it here, a flood of healing grace. There's the connection again. God is glorified by pouring upon the world a flood of healing grace that was never to be obstructed or withdrawn till the plan of salvation should be filled. Grace poured out on those of us who don't deserve it. Satan was exulting that he had succeeded in debasing the image of God in humanity. Here's the picture. Jesus comes, Satan's got 4,000 years behind him, he's saying, look at what I've done. I got... We can see, man, man's a mess, all of mankind. Then Jesus came to restore in man the image of his maker. So where is the work of this deity glorifying himself and pouring out grace, healing grace on the earth? In healing us from our sin. Jesus came to restore in man the image of his maker. What are we talking about? The image of his maker. She goes on to say, none but Christ can fashion anew the character that has been ruined by sin. See, she's picking up on the same idea. The way God is glorified 
is by pouring out his healing grace on us. And his grace working in us restores his image, not a physical look, but in fact a character likeness to God. That's the key here. It's character likeness. She goes on, he came to expel the demons that had controlled the will. I like that. Take away the power of Satan, the power of sin. This is a real thing in the life of the believer. He came to lift us from the dust, to reshape the marred character after the pattern of his divine character, and to make it beautiful with his own glory. Do you see that? Can our characters be beautified, beautiful with the glory of God? It's interesting. I, I have to tell you, this was one of the, I don't know, most exciting studies I've done for myself recently. Something where I, I kept coming across these statements and starting to see this picture. That God, where his real glory is, is what he does in you and me. If you really want to see what God is like and what makes God tick, so to speak, it's what lengths he goes to to work in us, to change us, to be like him in character. It's a powerful thought. Powerful thought. When we are imbued with divine grace and our characters are transformed, we receive glory from God. It's his glory. It's never ours. We can never claim it as something emanating from us of ourselves. And yet we can have a character that reflects his glory. Do you follow this? So we get glory from God. Our characters are made beautiful with his glory, and that in turn brings glory to God. He is glorified by filling us with his glory. Isn't that an amazing thing? It's a, a, it really brings us close to him. Again, how Ellen White puts this is just fantastic. In the Youth Instructor from 1896, Jesus Christ came into our world and assumed our nature in order that God might be glorified in humanity. Certainly in the humanity of Jesus, while he lived on this earth, but more in our humanity as well, in order that God might be glorified in humanity. In order that humanity might be uplifted and glorified in Christ. That last part of the sentence is the one that caught me. Wait a minute. Humanity glorified in Christ. Are we glorified? Again, I'm going to tell you, I'm just being straight up with you, I have always thought of the idea of glorification as, well, that one's down the road. Justification for sure here, sanctification, we're working on it, maybe it's here. Right now, I believe sanctification is fully here, but glorified? Is humanity uplifted and glorified in Christ? Absolutely. Moreover, Paul says, whom he predestined, these he called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. I have read that verse, I don't know how many times, and I've always wrestled with it. Because it's all past tense, right? God predestined us before the foundation of the world. God has called us, we know that, right? God has justified us, I hope we all know this. But Paul goes right on without missing a beat and says, and these he also glorified, past tense. Wait a minute, if glorification's in the future, and it is, there is a glorification of the flesh, a glorification that changes everything when we're raised again. But there's also this idea of a present glorification, and that is that God dwells in us and his image is reflected, thus glorifying him. But we are lifted up, and we are glorified in this whole process. Again, Jesus is the, is the model. We saw how at his birth, but the whole story of his life, when was Jesus glorified? When he ascended to heaven? I'm going to share some verses with you again. We read about his birth, but Jesus talks about glory during his life. Look at this, John 17. This is a fabulous, this is one of my favorite chapters. 
like I've said probably about a couple others along the way. But John 17, Jesus praying for us. Is there anything just more awesome than that? Jesus praying for us? I love it. And so Jesus spoke these words, it says, He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. What's he talking about? This is just before he goes to the cross. This is not just before he goes to heaven. That was down the road another few weeks, right? This is just before he goes to the cross. This is the night that he has taken. And his prayer is, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. That has to make you think a little bit right there, doesn't it? When is Jesus glorifying the Father? When he gets back to heaven? While he's on the cross. While he's on the cross, he's glorifying the Father. The lowest point of condescension is the greatest glorification. It's an amazing thought. We think backwards. I think sometimes Satan has got our heads so backward, we, we, we think the wrong things are important. <laughs> Kidding? <laughs> yeah, we get it wrong, don't we? All the time. We have to, I mean, this, this tells me how much work the Lord has to do to, to, to get me straightened out to his way of thinking instead of Satan's way of thinking. A couple verses later, verses 4 and 5, same chapter, Jesus says, I have glorified you on earth. This should put it to rest that Jesus' glorification was somewhere at the end. Jesus says, I've glorified you on earth. Here, my whole life. I have finished the work which you've given me to do, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And I'm thinking to my, oh, there it is. That's where he's talking about the other glorification. But the more I think about it, I'm not so sure that's it. Because where is the glory of God better revealed than the cross? Even of who God was before sin ever entered the world. The real way to see God's character is still on the cross. The glory which I had with you before the world was. Do you know what we read in uh, Philippians 2 that Jesus said, we're told he thought it not robbery in the King James. Not something to be grasped and held on to. To be counted equal with God. To be counted as God. But humbled himself and took the form of a servant. He lowered himself. While he was God, before all of this was all a problem down here, this was already his mindset. I'm willing to go to any depths to restore man. To what I've always wanted him to be. The glory which I had with you before the world was certainly has to apply to the character of God. And then he says this a few verses later in John 17, the glory which you gave me, I have given them. And there it is again, past tense. The glory you gave me, I've given them. Talking about his disciples, his followers that they may be one just as we are one. In other words, the same way, Lord, that you and I are of the same mind and character. We have the same driving motives to see people saved. This is what I've given to my followers, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. If anything points out the love of God, it is this work of his glory being manifest in us. The glory of grace is the glory of God's character. It's also the glory of his law because the law is a transcript of his character. Furthermore, the glory of grace is the glory of his character in you and in me. The glory of his grace is the restoration of of his image in mankind, in you and in me. I'm going to make a turn here, kind of a sharp turn, so I'm just going to get you thinking here. We've talked about the glory of the advent, the first advent, and there are some things that uh, crossed my mind again when I read through it that were new to me. 
I'm basically going to put out, this is kind of the raw ingredients. You're going to have to cook it yourself. Because it's new. This is that new way of thinking to me. But some things caught my attention when I read the account and I was trying to dig into the meaning of the Advent account. Angel comes. He shares the gospel. The glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and all of this. And guess what came to mind? There's some similarities in the second advent. Particularly in the three angels' messages and the Revelation 18 angel, who is kind of the, the, whatever you will, compilation of the first three. And I just want you to think about some of the language as we have considered the story of Christ coming the first time. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, again, well-known verses. I saw another angel. Do you remember there was an angel that showed up to the shepherds back in Bethlehem? Or somewhere near Bethlehem? I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. That first angel back at the first advent said, right, he came by himself before the rest of the group and he came and he said, I bring you good tidings, glad tidings of great joy. I bring you the gospel. And here in the end time, God's people who are represented by an angel. We'll get into this more. I, my intention is over the next few weeks, months, to kind of shift gears into a little bit more of prophecy. But this, the idea of God's grace and the gospel had to be the basis, the foundation. But get the idea, the connection here. This angel in the midst of heaven has the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice. It's interesting. The story in the first account says the angel came to preach glad tidings of great joy, and then there's this whole other message. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This angel comes with the everlasting gospel and says with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him. Glory to God in the highest, and now at the second advent, give glory to him. Do you guys see this connection, or am I just like barking up the wrong tree here? I think that there's something here, and, and I haven't put it all together yet, but it is interesting that we have so many of the same elements that come in. For the hour of his judgment has come. Now it's interesting. It's a different time, a different work coming into being. But it still says, worship him who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So we see here in the account, especially at the first angel there. And then Revelation 18. And again, the angels here are representatives of God's people. It says that, uh, you know, the angel came with the everlasting gospel, and we're, it, we're clear. Jesus, when he, at the, as he was closing his ministry, told his disciples, it's your job to spread the gospel, right? It's your job, spread the gospel. So we know it's not the work of angels. We don't sit back and let the angels do it. The angel represents the work of God's people on earth. And so with Revelation 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. We could say the glory of the Lord shone all around them, couldn't we? Isn't it essentially the same language? The glory. Here, the earth is illuminated with his glory. I'm going to keep it right there first, because I need to talk a little more about that. God's glory is his character. Is it possible that this whole point of Revelation 18 is that God's people, represented by an angel are to lighten the earth the same way that angel just lit up the plains with the glory of God, are God's people to light up the whole earth with a revelation of his character? Let me propose that that's not a revelation of talking about his character, but it's a revelation that people can see in us. The restoration of the image of God in us. The idea of being equipped with grace for every good work. The idea of being a people who can bring that kind of glory to God. And that brings me to this verse, one again we're all familiar with, I think, from the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, and there it is again, glorify the Father. What a subject, the idea of the glory of grace. 
And just as I said earlier, we'll change the wording just a little bit. Not to choose that God shall be glorified in you is to choose that he shall not be glorified in you. This is the thing. No two ways. To choose that God shall not be glorified in you is to choose that Satan will be glorified in you. We have a choice to make that we have this choice. But man, we have the promises in abundance. Through the grace of Christ, from Christ's Object Lessons, page 301, we may accomplish everything that God requires. You believe that? Everything? Through grace, we can accomplish everything God requires. All the riches of heaven. The reason we can, look at what it says. All the riches of heaven are to be revealed through God's people. Where do the riches come from? From here? No. They come from God. But he does it in us. And all the riches of heaven are to be revealed through God's people. If that doesn't lighten the whole earth with his glory, I don't know what would. Do you? Herein is my Father glorified, says Christ, that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. There's a direct connection between the closing work of this earth's history, the people that God has put here to do that job, and his work of character, transformation. That's our calling. I think a good place to close is with the great prayer of the Apostle Paul, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name or the character of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him. Who gets glorified in this deal? God gets glorified in us, but we are glorified in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I would say that uh, the glory of God's grace is currently my favorite topic. I'm going to keep studying it, and I want you to think about the things that I've shared with you today. A lot here to ponder. It really makes me think a lot more deeply about what is God's grace. But what it really does is it assures me that God is so committed to doing a work in me that I need done. How can it go wrong? If I don't stand in the way, then there is nothing to keep him from doing what he wants to do. Because it will not only glorify me, it will glorify him. What a deal, what a deal. Let's pray.